This is the Capital Rundown. Invest that $50 million into securing the border, maybe actually increasing that number. And only 28% of voters could successfully say that inflation over the past year had been 4% or less. Republican colleagues voted against protecting our freedom. It's all straight ahead. The Capitol Rundown starts now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Siobhan Klepfer. There is no shortage of news when it comes to what's happening in Michigan politics, both in Lansing and Washington, D.C., so let's get you caught up. We start this morning with Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel speaking at a news conference about perceived threats to the LGBTQ community in the state. On Wednesday, Michigan Democrats took part in the conference with Nessel, the Michigan House LGBTQ Plus Caucus, and others. The event was a chance to promote the Biden-Harris campaign and speak out against what they say is hateful anti-LGBTQ rhetoric coming from Donald Trump and mega Republicans. It's easy when things are going well, when you have all the rights in the world, it's easy to disregard and think that things were always this way, but they weren't. And we can go back very, very swiftly. The advocacy group Out Leadership recently released a report that says Michigan is a low risk state when it comes to discrimination against the LGBTQ community. The report points out the expansion of the Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act and the banning of conversion therapy as just two of the reasons for the score. Well, as of Tuesday, the southern border of the United States is shut down to most asylum seekers. President Joe Biden announced new plans aimed at addressing the immigration crisis. Washington, D.C. correspondent Hannah Brandt breaks down the new policy. President Biden says the southern border is overwhelmed, so he's taking executive action to start turning migrants away. Doing nothing is not an option. We have to act. President Biden is taking on immigration with a new policy. Tuesday, he announced officials will shut down the border when the average number of daily crossings hits 2,500. And it won't open back up until that slows to an average of 1,500 crossings per day or less. This action will help us gain control of our border, restore order to the process. With crossings already above the threshold, the border should shut down immediately. Only migrants who express credible fear of returning to their home countries will get to see an asylum officer. Other migrants will be deported. And the new standards for threats in someone's country of origin are now stricter than before. To protect America as a land that welcomes immigrants, we must first secure the border and secure it now. Republican leaders criticized the move, with Speaker Mike Johnson saying it's too little, too late. Now, suddenly, oh, now he wants to issue some weak executive order. And Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell suggests this is just an empty election year stunt. This is like turning a garden hose on a fire alarm fire. But Democratic Senate Leader Chuck Schumer defended the policy, saying the president took this step because Republicans killed a bipartisan border bill meant to address immigration issues. The president is left with little choice but to act. On his own. Though some Democrats have expressed worries. I'm concerned that this is just, you know, the enforcement only side of the strategy. The skeptical Democrats say more needs to be done to make legal immigration easier. But many of them say that needs to be done through legislation, not executive action. In Washington, I'm Hannah Brandt. Michigan Republicans were quick to come out against the new set of rules. In a press conference Tuesday titled Biden's Border Bloodbath, party members criticized what they say is a soft stance on immigration. He could work on securing the border. Uh, his latest budget reduces uh, any more construction of the border wall by $50 million. Uh, maybe go back and invest that $50 million into securing the border, maybe actually increasing that number. Uh, there are a whole range of policies, but what we're seeing from the Biden administration is we're going in the other direction. This executive action that he is taking today, whether the number is at 2,500 per day or whether it's a 4,000 or whether it's at 5,000, doesn't do anything. Senior members of the Biden campaign say Republican holdouts have been the real reason for a lack of progress on the border crisis, and they blame candidate Donald Trump for telling Republicans not to support any border deal before the election. In Donald Trump's Republican Party, he uses immigrants as punching bags. He has offered no solutions to create more immigration judges, to provide more lawful ways to get to citizenship. If you care 
about fixing a broken system, you put your politics aside. You come to the table, you settle your differences, and you do what is right for our country. Members of Congress heard from Dr. Anthony Fauci for the first time since he left his government job. And coming up, we'll tell you what a Michigan representative had to say about that. But first, a vote on protecting access to contraception was held in the Senate this past week. We'll have those details and a lot more when the Capitol Rundown returns. Welcome back. A birth control bill is grabbing attention on Capitol Hill. On Wednesday, Republican senators voted against the legislation in a move that Democrats say threatens women's access to contraceptives. Hannah Brandt tells us more about what happened, including the reaction from Democratic Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. A giant inflatable IUD stands in front of Union Station in D.C. A visual representation of birth control just blocks away from the Capitol, where lawmakers just held a vote on the Right to Contraception Act. The motion is not agreed to. Democrats say they're angry that Republicans voted to kill the bill. Here we are in a situation where today Republican colleagues voted against protecting our freedom to make our own decisions about birth control. Senator Debbie Stabenow calls the move shocking, but Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer says they won't give up. We Democrats will not stop. We will keep fighting. But Republican Senator John Corning calls the bill absurd. And it's a waste of time. He argues birth control access is not in jeopardy from Republicans or anyone else. Contraception is available in every state in America, and there's no legitimate effort to change that. But Senator Tim Kaine disagrees, pointing to the Supreme Court's decision to overturn abortion rights. For those who are saying, oh, this is a non-issue, go back and read the Dobbs decision. Read the invitation that was made by the court to go after contraception. Though Senator John Thune claims this bill is all for political show. These votes have nothing to do with legislating and everything to do with boosting Democrats' electoral chances also on the Hill this week, Dr. Anthony Fauci testified before the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic. It was his first public appearance in Congress since he left his job as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The subcommittee has spent 15 months investigating the origins of the virus. Republicans claim Dr. Fauci, Fauci tried to cover up a theory that COVID-19 was created in a lab in China. A report out last year showed U.S. intelligence agencies have differing opinions about where the virus came from. Democrats, including Congresswoman Debbie Dingell of Michigan, says their GOP counterparts are on a political witch hunt rather than a fact-finding mission. You know what worries me the most? Is the lack of public trust and public health. My own state, people aren't getting measles vaccines. People aren't getting vaccines for diseases that were almost eradicated and they're coming back. We need to be working together. Public trust in public health is the foundation of safety for this country. Political games is destroying that public trust. Dr. Fauci has received credible death threats since 2020 and fears the negative and violent attitude some people have toward public health officials will discourage younger generations from doing similar work. Coming up, our Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik will be here to fill us in on what's happening behind the scenes in Michigan politics, including the seeming gap between how Michiganders feel about the economy and how the economy is actually doing. That and much more next. Welcome back. The United States economy is a machine with millions of moving parts, and there are no simple fixes when something goes wrong. But whether it's strong or weak, responsibility for it is usually placed at the feet of the current president. Here's our Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik with a look at some numbers and how Americans interpret them in an election year. May of 2022, inflation hit a record of 8.6%, the highest it was in some 40 years. That historic number, two years ago, sent the stock market into a tizzy and sent Mr. and Mrs. Consumer into a deep funk as food prices on the shelf and gas at the pump skyrocketed too. President Joe Biden got most of the blame for the record inflation back then, but now, with inflation at just over 3%, he is getting none of the credit for lowering the rate. This pollster discovered, much to the 
the chagrin of the White House that 61 percent of the voters in Michigan believe we are in a recession, or put another way. And only 28 percent of voters could successfully say that inflation over the past year had been 4 percent or less. We've got a number of voters, quarter of voters, who think it's been over 8 percent over the last year. So what's the big deal that a majority are wrong on the state of the economy? Well, in poll after poll, the economy is rated as the number one issue with voters. A majority believe that Donald Trump is better qualified to handle that than the current president. Voters don't have a good gauge of what's happening. And the bad news for the White House, theoretically, misinformed voters on the state of the economy could cost Mr. Biden his reelection. Well, speaking of finances, the Michigan Attorney General just gave her opinion on financial disclosures for public officials. Tim talked to the rundown's Jerome Duran about that, as well as why people are already talking about Michigan's gubernatorial race in 2026. It's time to get updated politically here in the state of Michigan and nobody better than this guy right here, Tim Skubik, to help us out. Tim, Attorney General Dana Nessel just issued an opinion stating that the Secretary of State can require public officials to disclose identifying information on sources of income. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, it's a little, a little confusing, isn't it? Uh, here's the backstory on all of this. In 2022, uh, Michigan voters overwhelmingly approved a financial disclosure package where lawmakers and politicians had to basically tell the people where their income is coming from. Under the Constitution, the lawmakers had to write the laws to actually implement what the voters wanted. And at the end of the day, the critics of the legislature said the lawmakers didn't go far enough. After the discussion, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, who basically described what the Attorney General did as a step forward and that, quote, we have more work to do, which is code for this doesn't go far enough. Well, Tim, let's look ahead to 2026. Things are already lining up <laughs> for the fight to be Michigan's next governor. What can you tell us about the early speculation? Yeah, I, I know what people are saying out there. Scooby, for crying out loud, let's get one election out of the way before we do the next one. And, and I understand that. But here's the harsh reality. Uh, we want people to be up to date. And whether they know it or not, below the radar, the race for governor is already underway. And a number of players are involved. More players on the Democratic side than on the Republican side. Why are they doing this now? Well, basically, you have to start now because the race for governor will start the day after the presidential election is done. So they're out there, they're doing what they need to do, getting their name known, raising money. And at the end of the day, because Governor Whitmer cannot run for re-election, she is term limited out. Everybody and his uncle who wanted to be governor at some point is probably going to put their name on this list, which, get, which will get longer rather than shorter. Coming up on the rundown, problems with signatures on Senate candidate petitions caused some uproar in Michigan over the last month. We'll tell you who state officials have certified, who they have not, and what they're doing about it. That story is next. Welcome back. After the race for Michigan's Senate seat was hit with allegations of improper candidate petition signatures, the front runners have now been certified. The Board of State canvassers voted to place top Republican candidates Mike Rogers, Justin Amash, and Sandy Pensler on the August 6th primary ballot. On the Democratic side, U.S. Representative Alyssa Slotkin was approved. Democratic groups contested the three Republican candidates' petition signatures, while actor Hill Harper, who is running in the Democratic primary, challenged Congresswoman Slotkins, but the state board found all had qualified. Democrat Nasser Beydoun was disqualified after it was found that the campaign address listed on his nominating petition signature sheets was a post office box and not a street address as required. A candidate must turn in 15,000 valid signatures to qualify for the primary ballot, they can turn in a maximum of 30,000 signatures to reach that number. And while an investigation by the Bureau of Elections found possible instances of fraud on some petitions, a report from the agency says there's no evidence that candidates were aware of it. And for his part, Beydoun filed a lawsuit to appeal the decision. He says the suit is more than about not being certified and that he is not going to let what he says are racist and Islamophobic threats stop his campaign.
Coming up next year on the Capitol Rundown, we will take a look at D-Day remembrances from Thursday. We'll take you to the nation's capital for a special ceremony honoring surviving veterans of the invasion of Normandy. Stay tuned. As President Biden and other world leaders gathered in Normandy, France on the 80th anniversary of D-Day on Thursday, thousands gathered at the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. to honor the few surviving veterans. Washington correspondent Maddie Beer Temple has more from the ceremony. James Barron landed on Juneau Beach in Normandy, France 80 years ago today. Jim made numerous trips across the English Channel caring for wounded soldiers. He's one of the few surviving veterans who fought to liberate Nazi-occupied Europe on D-Day. Well, I had just turned 18 when Pearl Harbor happened, and I was stunned. Barron remembers joining the Navy after the attacks on Pearl Harbor. And then after a while, when it started to sink in, I thought, I, I'm ready to go. And so I missed it. Colonel Frank Cohn served in France not long after. Ended up on Omaha Beach about three months later as an infantry replacement. Cohn said he wants Americans to remember what was at stake in World War II. But hopefully the new generation will pick this up and will understand uh, they really brought freedom to us. And while D-Day was a critical turning point of World War II, each of these 4,048 stars here at the World War II Memorial represent 100 service members who died in the war. That includes Deronda Elliott's father, Franklin. He tripped a mine that had been planted there by Rommel's troops. She now shares her father's story and encourages others to never forget those who fought for freedom. We have to remember how much it took to win that war, how many lives were lost how many people were wounded, how many people had PTSD. I mean, and we can't forget those things because that's why we're free today. In Washington, I'm Maddie Beer Temple. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching the Capitol Rundown. We will see you all again right here 